Welcome to the Open Forum in the Villages Florida podcast. In this show, we talk to leaders in the community, leaders of clubs and interesting folks who live here in the villages, to give perspectives of what is happening here in the Villages Florida. We hope to add a new episode most Fridays at 9 a.m. We are a listener-supported podcast. There will be shout-outs for supporters in episodes. As a supporter, you will get a direct email link to my. In Season 5, we are making significant improvements and changes on an ongoing basis. How can you support our podcast? This is Mike Roth, and listeners, I'm thrilled to share with you this podcast, which is my passion project for you. This podcast brings me joy, brings you knowledge, inspiration, and a lot of things that people need to know about the villages and the people that are living here and what's actually going on. Creating this podcast is a labor of love, even though it demands more time than I can easily spare. But hey, Time isn't something we can buy back, right? Now, here's where you come in, the unsung heroes and heroines. You can help us keep the podcast alive and thriving. How? By becoming a supporter. There are two simple ways that you can support us. The first is a small monthly donation. Visit our podcast website, openforuminthevillagesflorida.com, and click on the black supporter box. Even a small 3 to $10 a month donation makes a difference. And guess what? You can cancel any time, no strings attached. The second way that you can contribute to the podcast is by making a purchase of an Amazon product at Amazon standard prices, and we are paid a small commission on each purchase as an Amazon affiliate. That way there's no extra money out of your pocket, but you are supporting the podcast. Check every week because we're going to be adding new Amazon products that you can buy and support the podcast with. Thank you. And your support means the world to us. Stay curious, stay inspired, and keep those headphones on. If you have a book that you would like to turn into an audiobook, let us know via email to mike at rothvoice.com. Hope you enjoy today's show. This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Villages. Today is a special episode. It's a double header. First, we're going to hear from Ann Castle, and then we're going to hear from Bob Tebow. They were both in my podcasting 101 course. Ann is going to talk about her psychic abilities and how she's helped police departments find missing people and solve cases. And Bob Tebow is going to talk about his book, and he's going to talk about a blog that he has. He's written about his life. Kind of a memoir. Should be interesting. Stay tuned. This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Village. I'm here today with Ann Castle. Ann, thanks for joining me. Hi, Mike, and I appreciate this opportunity. Ann has had a long history of working with law enforcement agencies and helping them solve cold cases. And how did you discover that you had that capability? I was born with a little more psychic ability than the average person. Now, all animals, plants, and people are psychic. It's part of our DNA. It is wired into our nervous system. And I was born with a little more ability than most. And in 2007, I had a major operation on my left leg, and I was in a wheelchair Mm -hmm. for about six months. And that was about the first time in my life I had stopped working, thinking, running, all of that. I'd had a, a busy career and information technology. Mm -hmm. It culminated as an IT director where I managed 90 some people and I worked 60 hour weeks, which didn't leave me a lot of time for this kind of thing. So being at home in a wheelchair was the first time I had stopped and I was watching the local news and a child had been shot and murdered. And all at once, I saw like a movie in my mind's eye. It was like a double exposure I could still see the TV Mm -hmm. in my room, but I also saw a film or a movie just passing through my mind's eye. It was in sepia, which is... Brown. Yes, which was weird, and I thought, this is strange, and I... What meds were you taking? (laughs) (laughs) And so I journaled it, because I keep a journal. I advise anybody who's trying to develop psychically to keep a journal because you'll often have precognition a few days before something happens, but we will forget that we had it, so we won't realize we're being psychic. But anyway, so I saw this crime, and I could see the perpetrator and how it happened and 
Brooklyn, where the body was. I journaled it and I just waited for the news account to verify what I had seen. What year was that? 2007. 2007. It was in the summer, I think July. And I thought, gee, that's interesting. And over the next three or four months, I did that four or five different times with different cases. Then I thought, okay, I'm on to something here. So I made a bunch of phone calls to psychics and psychic research, Monroe Institute, Duke University, etc. And I ended up being psychically trained by a psychic from Buffalo named Carol Ann Liaros. And she mentored me for about a year. At the end of that time, she gave my name to a detective in Buffalo who worked with the cold cases. And he called me up and a woman had been dead, missing for about 18 months. And while I was on the phone with him, he was on the phone to an officer in a patrol car. Okay. And I guided them to, to uh, the bot. And that put me on their radar. Mm -hmm. I began working a number of cases for Buffalo, Amherst, New York, Queens, New York, NYPD. And then I got into, I'm not even sure what to call it, some kind of an underground police kind of network. And my name started to spread. I haven't ever advertised. Uh, it's all been by word of mouth. And in roughly 16 years, I've worked about 180 cases mm -hmm. in eight countries and 20 states. And what kind of success rate have you had with these 180 cases? My success rate for the past year has been 54% in finding a, a target. Sometimes I don't find the target, but I might find accomplices. I might find weapons. I will try to give them information that they can, can use. A lot of times with a cold case, they'll have a body. They may have a suspect. They may know where the crime scene is, but they don't have court admissible evidence. And without that, the, the DA can't proceed with the case. Now, you do this pro bono for the yes. police departments? You don't get paid to do it? it, it if they want me to travel somewhere, then I insist that they pay for that. Sure. And if a private person wants me to, to work for them, I will expect payment from them. I don't charge law enforcement for a couple of reasons. One, police departments have a hard time believing in psychic. So there are always some on the team who think I'm some kind of a fake or a scammer. Secondly, when they're working a case, especially if it's a missing person or a felon, I don't have the time, they don't have the time to get approval for payment, to negotiate a rate, send that through their captain or accounts payable or whatever financial mm -hmm. process they have is a total waste of time. And plus, if it's in the 46% where I, I don't succeed, then I feel like a schmuck if I've accepted their payment and I've turned up nothing. So this way, w w when I work pro bono, I can you jump on a case more quickly, and everyone knows I'm at least trying, mm -hmm. even, even if I, I don't succeed. Do you do work here in uh, Sumter County? I haven't yet. Uh, no, I've only lived here three or four months. Oh, okay. I was talking to uh, one of the candidates for sheriff in, in the coming election cycle, and I think his name is Anthony Pellicino, and you can go back and listen to his episode. But one of the things that, as new sheriff, he wants to do, he wants to solve the 13 open open cases, what do you call them? Cold, 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 cases. Ca cold mm -hmm. cases here in Sumter County that he thinks should be solved, or at least a large percentage of them. Uh, that might be an interesting connection for you. Yes. Colder cases are harder than one that is fresher. I mean, you can come to a dead end at a cold case mm -hmm. that's a month old, or it can be, I worked a case in North Texas a while back, it was a 30-year-old case. I did not succeed. There is a connection between DNA and psychic connection. And the older the case is, the more difficult it is for a psychic to solve mm -hmm. because the psychic evidence evaporates mm -hmm. over time. So the fresher the case, the more successful. Mm -hmm. I'm at. What was your most <clears throat> take two? What was your most recent case or most recent successful case? I've had a number of successful cases and recent ones. And I also work missing person c cases and I track felons. 
which is a slightly different technique. Mm. But when a person goes, I had a, a case in Atlanta a couple of months ago, and I w- was able to take a photo, or they sent me a photo. I need a photo, I need a full name and last known whereabouts. Mm. Then I can meditate, and I will often come up with a a direction of where they've gone. I'll sketch out a map. Then I get on maps Google. And with my right index finger, I trace on the map where they've gone. Mm -hmm. I'll get a little pressure or or a vibration in this finger if I'm on the right track. You're touching your right index finger. Yes. And you touch that to the map. To the screen, to the monitor. To the monitor, and and you actually can feel the energy. So that was right before Christmas, and I found the person. It was a, a teenage girl who was angry and just sort of ran away. Mm-hmm. There were a lot of those cases. Yes. In fact, something like 70% of missing t- teenagers ha- have actually left voluntarily. I don't remember what the second. About, um, it was about how I became psychic and, and realized I was psychic. You, we did that, didn't we? <laughs> you were in the wheelchair and from an ap- operation and that gave you time to think and, and allow yourself the ability to have the time to develop your skill that you you didn't know how it would happen. But I've been psychic and other things before. Mm-hmm. I I was I have seen people's auras my entire life. So you can see my aura now. Yes, and auras have different colors and vibrations, and I've taught myself to recognize what the aura tells me through its colors. Okay, so what does the my aura tell you about from this color? You mostly a left-brained person. But you have some right brain ability too, meaning that you think and solve problems with your whole brain. And believe it or not, most people don't. And you are good at whatever you set out to do. You can be successful in a variety of fields. You have a good financial mind. You communicate well. You can synthesize information much better than the average person. You're also very intelligent. You have a really good sense of humor. You're loyal. You're pragmatic. You don't take BS from anyone. You don't have a need to be liked or accepted. If people like you, fine. If they don't, fine. And you're okay with all of that. Very interesting. A lot of that's true. I'll have to make sure my wife hears that. <laughs> <laughs> and then send a co- copy to my daughters and grandchildren. <laughs> Good. Uh, so if someone uh, has a case that they might need some help on, how would they get a hold of you, Anne? If they're law enforcement, mm-hmm. my website is annecastle.net, A-N-C-A-S-T-L-E.net. Mm-hmm. And that is primarily for law enforcement. And, and there is an email through there that they can send me information. I check my email several times a day, and then I'll call them back. And then I will have to verify that they are actually police. I've been scammed by people pretending to be police, wanting fake readings or debunkers. I've helped to put people in prison. So I've had death threats. I've been shot at. So I have to verify that the person I'm talking to is law enforcement. Mm-hmm. If it's a private person, then that's a different conversation. I will charge them a, a thousand a day. That's a flat rate, and I will expect a uh, payment first. Mm-hmm. Okay, and thanks for joining us today on Open Forum in the Villages. Thank you, Mike. I've enjoyed it, and I wish you much success with all your podcasts. I think they're fascinating. And as one of my podcast students, I hope you get your own podcast (laughs) on the air soon. I am giving it some serious thought. Good. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Mike. And Curtis, can you give uh, our patients a tip on keeping their brain healthy? Absolutely. My favorite tip is involves a change in eating patterns, but it's not a drastic change. It's simply increasing the amount of fresh fruits and vegetables, fish, other white meats, and lowering the amounts of red meat, sweets and sugars, and also carbohydrates. It's essentially following a Mediterranean type diet plan. Thank you, Dr. Curtis. Dr. Curtis's goal is to educate the village's community on how to live a longer, healthier life. To learn more, visit his website, craigcurtismd.com or call 352-500-5252 to attend a free seminar.
This is Mike Roth on Open Forum in the Villages, Florida. I'm here today with Bob Tebow. Bob, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Bob is a longtime resident of the Villages, and he's got some interesting stories to tell. Bob was a member of our podcasting 101 for Beginners class. Did you enjoy the class, Bob? I enjoyed the class. I intend to start a podcast of my own, and you gave me great ideas. I'm working with my daughter in California. That's how it's going to we're going to be talking to each other across the country. Okay. You're going to record it over Zoom? Yes. Okay. What kind of microphone are you going to be using? I can't tell you the brand, but it's one of the ones that you recommended. Okay. That's good. These are the ones I recommend for two reasons. Number one, they sound great. And B, they're about a third less than the ones that most people would recommend, like a Shore or a Rhodey. Both good microphones. Yeah. You want uh, things to sound good because that's what you're doing. Recording. That's right. Yeah. And the, the other situation is that over time, even though it's a digital recording, it may get degraded when you change it from a WAV file, which is what we're recording now, to an MP3. There's a reduction in quality. Who knows what's going to happen in the future to audio recording. So the, the higher the quality you get at the original point of recording, the better it's going to sound long term. So Bob, why did you decide to write a blog about your life? When I was growing up, we had a large family. We gathered frequently for holidays and birthdays. And I was lucky if I kept quiet, I could listen to the adults tell stories. And mm -hmm. I liked their stories. I, I found it entertaining. I remembered mes many of them. But my own children didn't have that experience. And so I decided I was going to write a blog about the things that I had learned from my family, mm -hmm. and then eventually read about things that had happened to me. So you, you completed the book? I have a book now, yes. I start, uh, That was not my intent. My intent was to write a blog, and I didn't know how long I was going to write it. I started in 2017, and I still write. I post twice a week. I post every Wednesday and every Sunday. And I got about 200 people that follow me mm -hmm. regularly. Okay. And uh, I find it very rewarding. Good. Good. Is there any particular blog post that got more listens than the others? Yes. When I write about my daughter, they like that. I think that they like that because she has a nickname. Her nickname is Beezy. Her real name is Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. And uh, and she also has written. So she's written a children's book. Okay. And then of late, I, I lost my wife 18 months ago. And after I lost her, many of my blogs were about what was happening to me. Mm. And uh, lots of people have thanked me for writing what I wrote because I write from the heart. I just tell you what I'm thinking and uh, not all my thoughts are joyful. Everyone's thoughts are always joyful. Right. That's true. The name of your book is Pondering Life's Lessons? Correct. When I There's three sections to the book. The first section is about how I met my wife and how we got married. Mm. We eloped. What people might find interesting is that she was engaged to somebody else 20 hours before we got married. Oh, wow. So that's the first story in the book. And the first section is about her and our, our kids and grandkids. The, section, the second section is about uh, friends and family, mm. stories that I learned when I was a kid. And uh, the third section is about my life since her passing. Wow. So, how many pages are in, in the book? I think there's about 220 pages. Mm -hmm. I took, uh, when I write my blog, I write anywhere from 500 to 1,200 words. And so, some are to be continued. And when I wrote the book, I had to get rid of the to be continued and edit the stories. Yeah. So, in creating your podcast, is it going to be a recap of the book or is it new material? It's going to be a combination of, of both. When uh, when my kids check in on me, I often, they'll ask me how I am, and I often will say, life's different now, because it is. And that's going to be the title of our podcast, Life. Life's Different Now. Life's Different Now. And uh, our lives are different because we lose people, because we gain people. I'm learning how to live alone. I'm learning to establish new friendships. Mm -hmm. And so the podcast will be about a little bit about loss and a little bit about growth. And I had a, in, 
intend to include my other family members. My grandkids have a point of view that only they understand. It's very interesting. They've been helpful to me. So they'll be included in the podcast. And uh, as they said, my daughter wrote a children's book. And it's a, it was written because a good friend of hers committed suicide. And anyway, the book came out of that. And so we have a common bond in terms of writing. Now, your wife died about two years ago. Be 18 months. 18 months. Okay. Eight what have you done significantly differently in that 18 months here in the villages? The biggest thing for me is I've joined some clubs. Okay. Uh, what I, clubs did you join? I joined the Memoir Writers. Okay. which has been very helpful to me. Okay. I, I look, I've given up Tuesday golf to go to the memoir writers group. I joined uh, single baby boomers. And so I go to some of those a activities. I am in, I have joined, but have not attended my first meeting of the single golfers of the villages. Mm. I got a couple groups of guys that I play cards with on a regular basis and I'm making new friends. Our friends were couples. We were, we were all couples and, and those friends have still included me, but occasionally I feel like the third wheel. My problem, not their problem. Mm -hmm. And trying to uh, establish new friendships and uh, because life's different now. Right. There, there are a lot of singles clubs in the villages. Yes. Yes. And, and I've enjoyed that. And uh, I've enjoyed meeting new people. Everybody's got a story. Mm -hmm. Everybody's story is different. And uh, that's really the theme of, of my book, too, because we're all different. What I've done, what I've learned through the process, I'll say, is we all have stories but we don't all share them. And I've taken it one step further and then I'm writing mine down. Good. Write them down, put them into your podcast, let them live forever for the next hundred years. Correct. That, that I think is the, the beauty of being able to do a memoir as a podcast. And uh, for some people who don't want to record a podcast, one of the things that, that I discovered I could do is take one of my automated voices, my AI voices, take someone's transcript, their Word file or their PDF, and turn it into an audible book for them. Very cool. I'm considering turning my book into an uh, audible book as well. I think reading something and hearing something are two different things. Mm, two different things, two different experiences. I know for me, it's got to be extra special for me to want to pick up a book and read a book. Yes. Okay, there's a book. Uh, I, I run the Improv Club, and a fellow named Del Close was one of the originators of improv, and he wrote a book. And I said, someone told me about it. I said, oh, gee, was, I'd love to read something that Del Close wrote. Go over to Audible, try to buy the book as an Audible book. Not available. I had to buy the print copy. <laughs> and some books don't translate well into a, an Audible book. I think his would have, but it was two with two authors, and two different voices. I've read that book and it's a, it's a very good book and I've used some of the material. But others, I'd rather listen to a book as I'm driving from here to there in the villages or just taking a walk. It's good exercise. I'll take that 30 minute walk and I'll listen to a 30 minute slug of the book. I have a friend who uh, purchased my book and right after he did, he read one or two stories every night. He said, this is how I'm turning my, my lights off. And okay. So that's comforting to me. Yeah, go for a few more minutes here, because when we take out all the dead silences, we'll lose a couple of minutes. Okay. Audacity, that's called truncation. One more good question. There we go. You've lived here in the villages for 20 years. What's your biggest pet peeve here in the villages? That's a good question. When I first moved here, the village people, whoever they are, sent out... When someone says that, I, I think of that, yes, that group correct. with the cowboy, <laughs> the village people. I'm going to say the village fathers, whoever the village fathers and mothers are. They would send out a, a survey. You know, what do you need? To, what don't you... What do we need? How things... How should things change? My, my single pet peeve in the beginning was... I paid a, a cart fee for my cart. So my wife and I went on a golf course and that was covered. But if my son got in that same cart, he had to pay $4 to ride on the cart. Mm -hmm. I thought I was paying a cart fee. Trail fee. Tra and uh, the trail fee dri still drives me crazy. Because, they still have that rule? Oh, yes. If the member in your household rides with you, you're okay. But if somebody outside of your household rides with you, they charge four hours. So if my neighbor, who, who likes to walk the golf course, rides with me in my trail fee paid cart, 
He has to pay four dollars. He has to pay five four dollars. Yes, he does, and I, I I think it's ridiculous. I still think it's ridiculous, and me, I don't know. Maybe that's why they don't send the survey out anymore because they don't want to hear that from me. So I think they don't want the input from the villagers. There you go. I, I'll tell you what my pet peeve is: is that there is no good explanation of what each club in the villages is and what they do. There are over thirty three hundred clubs in the villages now, and well, some of them are fairly obvious. Pickle, intermediate pickleball at uh, Savannah Center. Okay, that's pretty obvious what that does. Correct. Okay. But what actually happens in the improvisational theater club meeting? What is that all about? Oh, I've heard of it, but I haven't a clue. Yeah, you come to the meeting. on. We do it on Monday nights, uh, first four Mondays of the month at Rowan. And you choose whether or not you want to get up and participate or be, uh, you can be an audience member. We have both at most most meetings and it's always a, a ton of laughs right <laughs> and the beauty is because it's improv no one has to learn lines learning lines at our age can be a little bit difficult for some people correct i, I follow that yes okay bob is there anything that you feel is outstanding about the villages that that you participate in i think the best thing about the villages is everybody's from someplace else and so whatever baggage you bring with you. If you leave it behind you, no one cares. I, I, I give the example of playing golf. I don't know if I'm playing with the president of the bank or the guy who cleaned the bathroom. And I like that. And I like, I like talking to people about where they're from and how they lived and they bring their stories here. And if we're lucky, we share them with other people. So that's my number one. Everybody's from someplace else. And, and, and you never know what you're going to get in the mix. Correct. It, Correct. It, it is fun. We've had some people come into our meetings that are just phenomenal. Well, I met all kinds of people. I met from around the world and interesting jobs, CA guys. And, and I've heard st sad stories, too, from people who, because their businesses have closed or their companies have closed, they've lost their pensions. And uh, But I like all the stories, and I like the fact that most people are willing to share. Yeah. It's a good, positive environment here. Correct, just, correct. You, you, you don't have to go very far to, to find somebody that you relate with and can get along with. So, Bob, if someone wants to pick up a copy of your book or read the blog on the web, how do they do that? The blog is I have a story for you dot net. They're going to be in the store for the whole month? Um, for three months. For three months, I belong to the other group I belong to is Writers of the Villages. Mm -hmm. And Writers of the Villages has an area in the local Barnes and Noble where local authors can put their books. I've been selected for April, May, and June. I'm going to be speaking on April 13th along with some other writers about our books. And So, how many days are you actually going to be in the store to autograph copies? We're only, when they go in there, the the books will already be autographed. Oh, okay. So they're we're we're prepared for that. Someday, if I'm famous and you've got my autograph and a book, you maybe make a lot of money. Who knows? Great. Thanks for being with us today, Bob. All right. Thank you for having me. Remember, our next episode will be released next Friday at 9 a.m. Should you want to become a major supporter of the show or have questions, please contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. This is a shout out for supporters, Tweet Coleman, Ed Williams, and major supporter Dr. Craig Curtis at K2 in the Villages. We will be hearing more from Dr. Curtis with short Alzheimer's tips each week. If you know someone who should be on the show, contact us at mike at rothvoice.com. We thank everyone for listening to the show. The content of the show is copyrighted by Roth Voice 2024, all rights reserved.